there was never really a, uh, a positive approval. So this 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 false labeling was a was a to a spontaneous reaction to a video was a direct contravention of the explanation offered by this president, president of Libya, and the facts on the ground impact our ability to investigate the crime scene afterward. How long was it, as you said, um, before the FBI was allowed um, access into Benghazi to examine that, that crime scene? Seventeen days. Seventeen days. Was the crime scene secured during that time? No, it was not. We so, repeatedly asked the government of Libya to secure the crime scene and prevent interlopers, but they were unable to do so. So let me get the time timeline finalized here. So the FBI is sitting in Tripoli for weeks, waiting for the approval of the Libyan government to travel to Benghazi. Is that appropriate? Well, they were attempting to do their job from, from Tripoli as best they could. But they were, uh, they were denied access into Benghazi, right? Correct. So what were they doing with their time? They were interviewing witnesses that uh, they could find in Tripoli and could meet with in Tripoli, and they were also engaging with the government in order to develop a cooperative investigation with the Libyans who had sent an, investigative team, an investigator to Benghazi. Were you in, interviewed by the FBI? No, I was never interviewed by the FBI. Never? Hmm. Nice story. I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to our witnesses for being here. And, you know, it's my understanding that we've had uh, nine oversight hearings on Benghazi since the horrific attacks on our consulate on September 11, 2012. And like many of my colleagues have expressed to the family, I believe that we uh, need to continue uh, to do everything within our power as Congress uh, to get to the solutions and the recommendations that will prevent them, uh, prevent this from happening again. And I think that in addition to our condolences, uh, the things that we need to do most is our job uh, to come up with the recommendations uh, to, to prevent this. One of the overall conclusions of the Accountability Review Board was just that, quote, that Congress must do its part to meet this challenge and provide necessary resources to the State Department to address security risks and meet mission imperatives. That was a direct uh, statement out of the, the review board recommendation. And I think each of you agree uh, that Congress must do its part. Am I correct? Yes or no, real quick. Yes. So, you know, Mr. Chairman, I just would hope that after this hearing, after nine oversight hearings, that we will begin to work on some specific recommendations that we can bring forward and that all of us working together uh, can do our job to protect our embassies. I think that's what the public wants. I believe and hope that that's what the families want in the memory and the legacy of those who lost their lives. And I would say that it does cost money. Uh, Mr. Nordstrom, I know you say it, it's not just about money, but it also is about properly prioritizing budget considerations. And, you know, in the past, you know, my colleagues on the other side have not been willing uh, to make the kinds of serious and sustained commitments to funding that are necessary uh, for large-scale and long-term security projects like building facility improvements, for example. Would, would the gentleman yield uh, briefly? May, may I? Of course. Thank you. And so in both the 2011 and 2012 uh, budget cycles, uh, the, the, the budgets gave the State Department hundreds of millions of dollars less than what was requested. The fiscal year 2013 budget as proposed by the other side proposed even more cuts to reduce international affairs budget by more than $5 billion less than it was in fiscal year 12. That is a 9.8% cut to diplomatic security when extrapolated across the whole foreign affairs budget. By the fiscal year 2016, 
proposed budget by the other side further cuts funding to international affairs by another five billion dollars. This represents a 20% cut to diplomatic security when extrapolated over the entire foreign uh, affairs budget. So these are serious and significant cuts and we cannot pretend that they don't have consequences. And so I know that my colleagues have talked several times about holding people accountable. Well, I hope that one of those groups that we will hold accountable are ourselves as members of Congress to do our job to properly fund the safety of our embassies so that this never happens again. I urge my Republican counterparts to work with us in a bipartisan effort to actually, to actually fund these improvements to our embassy security and to follow through on the 29 ARB recommendations that have already been made and those that we believe should also be supported from this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I note for the record that Charlene Lamb, who testified before this committee at a previous time, was asked specifically the question as to whether or not funding issues uh, impacted uh, the actions that took place, and she said no. So, but, uh, and I'm really intrigued at this point in time by some of the commentary because one of the things I'd like to follow up on the questioning, Mr. Nordstrom, of, uh, that came to you from Mr. Langford uh, with regard to some of the decisions that were made because uh, being in Benghazi, having the secretary, because I'm going to tell you, I am struggling to find out how we had a United States ambassador in a marginally safe American compound in an increasingly hostile area on an iconic day like September 11th with limited security. And I think that there are some issues that you were talking about first. Decisions that were made about allowing occupancy in the first place. Could you tell me quickly about how that was enabled to be approved? Uh, that's, that's the same question I still have to this day. You do not know, but you do I know according to the law, it appears that it must be signed off by the Secretary of State and there is no delegation. Certainly for parts of it, yes, for the, for the second portion of it. Following up, on July 31st, it's a fact that there were, I go back on the record, there were 16 SSTs, special forces in Libya, 14 Department of State security personnel. On August 31st, just shortly before, that had been reduced to six regulation individuals in Tripoli, three in Benghazi. Why the cutback on security? Uh, again, that's th one of the, the questions that I had. I've never seen it addressed in the ARB or anything else, is why were these decisions that we made uh, turned down? Why were, in fact, there was a proposal that went back all the way to uh, a month after we had arrived, asking for $2.1 million uh, for staffing to have 19 DS agents maintained throughout that time period. I still don't have any understanding as what happened to that proposal. That went to the Undersecretary of Management as Did part of Did you have fraud. confidence in the ability of the, uh, the locals in the country who were purportedly designed to, to provide security for you? Did you have confidence in their ability to provide that? I think to put it succinctly, it was uh, the best bad plan. Um, it was the only thing we had. It was the only thing that I didn't ask if it wanted. Did you have confidence in that? No. Did you report that at any point in time to officials in Washington, D.C.? We did. We did uh, note the training deficiencies in particular. That was something that was always there. Uh, certainly, we had also raised the issue of doing some sort of counterintelligence vetting um, of the people that worked for us. Uh, ultimately, uh, that was turned down, even though we wanted it because the Department of State wanted Post to pay the, the funds for it, which we didn't have. It had always been under our understanding that that was going to be paid for by Washington. Thank you. So, Mr. Thompson, I, I, I know that you have background in counterterrorism. I'm going back on this is this is testimony that was provided by Lieutenant Colonel Wood, who was an SST person doing service in Tripoli and ultimately wanted to be in Benghazi. He talked about Facebook threats that were made about Western influences in Benghazi. 
I also note then a series of issues. An RPG attack on the Red Cross in early May, a Red Cross second attack in June, an IED attack against the uh, UN mission in April 6, an IED attack against a UN convoy on April 10th, an assassination attempt on the British ambassador in June 11th with RPGs, an attempted carjacking on August 6th of two SST officers of the United States. In your mind, does this, in your professional opinion, would this suggest to you that the facility in Benghazi by a reasonable person with your experience or a reasonable person in the State Department would be likely to be considered a possible or even likely target of a terrorist incident? It, it certainly uh, had all the uh, indicators of that based on that, that history. Yes, Congressman. And in light of that, and in light of your experience and Mr. Nordstrom's testimony, would you have been happy with the idea that it was allowed to be maintained under less than the staffing that had existed only a month before or two months before and under standards which were only two in the entire country, according to the testimony of Mr. Nordstrom, that were not meeting the requirements, the minimal requirements of safety? No, sir. That doesn't make Mr. Nordstrom or Mr. Hicks, what is normalization and why were we doing this? That's That's been a question that even that the IRB uh, raised and others have raised. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, uh, sarcastically, we, we saw it as do more with less, but uh, that I first saw that, that term, normalization, uh, in that budget proposal, a resource proposal, a month after we had arrived. There was already talk about normalizing our footprint. It was then picked up again in February when the uh, when Greg's uh, predecessor had met with Das Lamb. Same thing. Uh, it, it struck me as being part of some sort of script, um, just like the reason why he didn't close the the facility in Benghazi despite the risks. There was already a political decision that said we're going to keep that open. That's fine, but no one's ever come out and said that that we made that risk. And we made that decision, uh, and then take a, take a responsibility for it. I think the gentleman. My time's re my expired, but Mr. Hicks, did you have a an answer, a response to that as well? Normalization to us was moving towards being like a normal embassy instead of having uh, being in a sense uh, under siege or in a in a, a hostile environment where we're surrounded by potential threats and we wanted to move towards normal life and it also meant removing our, our a withdrawal of extra DS personnel uh, and and then the movement towards our diplomatic security personnel managing more of a of a program that included the recruitment of Libyans to provide additional sec the, the security that we needed thank you uh, uh, Mr. Hicks, you, you mentioned earlier your, your your wife being such an important part of your decision process. Were you planning on bringing her to Libya since it was normalized? Uh, just, Mr. Chairman, thanks. Uh, just to correct, I, I was actually selected to be DCM by Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, Jeff Feldman, and in Tripoli. Uh, Jeff and I spent a lot of time in the 2006 war in Lebanon together. Yeah. He's a good man. Yeah. But... Uh, but, but as, as to family returning to Libya, I mean, normalization means you bring back dependents right. and so on. Was that part of what was going on? That's what, we're, that's what we were pointing towards, in fact. Uh, and, and Chris and I had a long talk on the night of uh, September 9th before he left for Benghazi. And we, we talked about this, that, that we felt optimistic about the trajectory. Even though all of these security problems were going on, we felt that the Libyans were getting their political act together. They were going to pull together a government. They were going to get a constitution. The co their economy was going to pick up. They were going to stabilize. And my next project was, in fact, to reach out to the board members of the American school and start working with them about the possibility of opening the school in September. And that would, of course, allowed me to bring my family to join me in, in Tripoli. And that was actually a condition that my wife made for my going to my second unaccompanied assignment uh, in uh, so
I'm sure she's glad to have you home now, though. Yes, she's very glad to have me home. With, with that, we go to the gentleman from New Mexico who's been patiently waiting. Oh, I'm sorry. Who, who's next? Mr. Cardenas, next. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, my condolences to all the families and everybody who suffered from this tragedy. And uh, also, I, I hope that you pray for us that we do the right thing uh, as policy makers and not as politicians. Um, Mr. Nordstrom, um, you've stated here that you felt the security situation in Benghazi was unsafe. Uh, as a matter of fact, you've been very clear on placing blame with a number of people. So given everything that was going on at the time and everything you have said today and what you said on October 10th, at any point did you suggest to Ambassador Stevens that he should not travel to Benghazi on uh, September 11th anniversary and that the situation was volatile and that the facility, uh, per your own assessment, was not secure? I had departed post on 26th of July, so I didn't have the opportunity to, to do that. Um, I, I would defer that to the RSO that was there at the time, John Martinek. Um, I, it's my understanding that he also had raised some concerns and discussed that. So you have your opinions today, but you did not have those same opinions back then? I, I, I wasn't at post okay. for, for September 11th. I had departed six weeks prior. So, uh, If the gentleman... I uh, would indulge. I think he's asking, were you, what was your opinion on the day you left relative to Benghazi? Oh, okay, I understand. Um, I had actually met with the with the ambassador prior uh, to that as part of an out briefing, um, and he and I talked about kind of the way forward, uh, and the threats in the east uh, were something that we talked about. Uh, I had mentioned that in, in October as well. Um, it was very concerning to us, uh, the, the increase in, in the targeting. It was something that I had mentioned back uh, to our headquarters in, in reporting. Uh, it was something that the Ministry of Interior brought up. Uh, when the ambassador went and met with the minister in July uh, to talk about requesting static security, they highlighted, number one, growing extremism in the east, particularly in Benghazi, and Derna, and Sirte. Um, so absolutely, that was something that, that we discussed, um, and we were concerned in particular that, that we were not getting the resources. So uh, you stressed that, that you did stress concerns, but not to the point where you said, I wouldn't go if I were you, or you uh, we, we never had that discussion, uh, in part because the ambassador had not uh, indicated any sort of uh, desire to travel to Benghazi. Um, it, my hope would, would have been that they would have had resources there to, to augment any such travel. And, and resources require other kinds of resources. I mean, if you have resources on the ground, they require actual funding, et cetera. There's a balance to creating the kind of atmosphere and security that would be re uh, required to meet any concerns, correct? Uh, sure. In, in what we were looking at is that you were going to have a, a downsizing of personnel um, in in Tripoli, so any time the ambassador would have traveled, uh, that would have impacted security in both locations because you would have been splitting up resources, um, which is what I think ultimately happened. Mr. Hicks, uh, can you shed some light on this discussion that we're having? In the two planning meetings that we had for Ambassador Stevens' trip to Benghazi, uh, Regional Security Officer John Martinick raised con serious concerns about his travel. Uh, because of those concerns, the ambassador adjusted his plans for that trip. First, he, he agreed that he would go in a low-profile way. His trip would not be announced in advance. We would not do any planning of meetings until right before he went. Uh, and uh, second, he eventually decided also to shorten his trip. He initially had planned to go on the 8th. He went on the 10th instead to narrow the time frame that he would be in Tripoli. The third step that he took was the one public event that he planned would take place at the very end of his trip just before he left. So, so basically, um, you're describing what I feel to be consistent. What I've um, known of the ambassador is that he was very, very committed. Um, he did listen to advice, etc., but he was very determined, and he continued to do his job. Exactly. He went there to do his job. He felt that he had a political imperative to 
go to Benghazi and represent the United States there in order to move the project forward to make ben, uh, the Benghazi consulate a permanent constituent post. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm so proud of his commitment and it, that is very consistent with everybody who's come across him. I just hope that we can have that commitment up here as elected officials to do the right thing so this never happens again. Thank you so much. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjardins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing is about one thing, one simple thing. It's finding the truth. And uh, I know these families here want the truth, and I know the American people want the truth. But yet, I listened to this questioning today, and there seems to be a real partisan feel to, to finding the truth, and I don't understand that. I mean, we are, if you, if you listen to the other side, you'd think it's time just to move on from this. They would agree with Secretary Clinton, right, that they would just say, what difference does it make? Well, some of the family members I talked to before this hearing, I guarantee this hearing makes a difference today. Uh, we want to know who made some of these decisions and why they made some of these decisions. The only encouraging part that I heard from the other side is that they feel that you all should be protected. Your ability to testify here and your desire to testify here should be protected, so that's good. And I want you to know I really appreciate you all being here. It really it does matter. It matters to a lot of people. Uh, Mr. Hicks, uh, after your visit uh, with Congressman Chaffet, or Ch Congressman Chaffet's visit, did you feel any kind of shift in the way you were treated? Yes, uh, again, uh, I did. When uh, Assistant Secretary Jones visited shortly after, once sh prior to the, the visit, Assistant Secretary Jones had visited and she pulled me aside and again said, uh, said I needed to improve my management style and, and indicated that people were upset. Uh, I had no indication that my staff was upset at all, other than with the conditions that we were facing. Uh, following uh, my return to the United States, I attended Chris's funeral in San Francisco, and then I came back to Washington. Assistant Secretary Jones summoned me to her office, and she delivered a, a blistering critique of my uh, management style and she uh, sa even said I exclaimed I don't know why Larry Pope would want you to come back a and she said she didn't even understand why anyone at Tripoli would want me to come back um, okay. um, but yet right after the attack and before the attack you had all kinds of praise for your leadership you got a call from Secretary Clinton you got a call from the president praising you for your service and how you handled things was there a seminal moment in your mind to win uh, all this praise and appreciation turned into something else? In hindsight, I think it began after I asked the question about Ambassador Rice's testimony, uh, statement on, on the TV shows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anyone listening to this hearing today, if they don't have questions, I mean, there was some comment made about, well, there was a few people in Libya that had a problem with this YouTube video, but the overwhelming evidence is that this was a, a terrorist attack. Everybody knew it, but yet, someone higher up decided to run with this story, this facade, and they kept it for a long time. And I would think that everyone sitting here wants to know the answer why uh, that was done. So what other impediments have you had, or how, how have you felt since deciding to come forward? Do you feel like uh, they treated you any differently uh, from that point on? Well, uh, after I was angry with the way uh, I'd been criticized, I thought it was unfounded. I felt like I'd been tried and convicted in absentia. And, uh, but I decided I was going to try to, I was going to go back and try to redeem myself. Uh, in, in what, what is your job right now? What is uh, my job? I am a foreign affairs air officer in the Office of Global Intergovernmental Affairs. Okay, a far cry from where you were and your level of capabilities. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so when you came back, the the United States. Were you planning on going back to Libya? I was. I fully intended to do so. And what do you think happened? Based on the, the criticism that I received, I felt that if I went back, I would never uh, be comfortable working there. And in addition, my family really didn't want me to go back. We'd endured a year of separation when I was in Afghanistan in 2006 and 2007. And that was the overriding factor. So I uh, voluntarily curtailed. I accepted an offer of what's called a no-fault curtailment. Uh, that means that there's there there would be no uh, criticism of, of my departure or post, no negative repercussions. And in fact, 
uh, Ambassador Pope when he made the offer to everyone in, in Tripoli when he arrived, I mean, Charge Pope, when he arrived, um, he indicated that people could expect that they would get a, a good onward assignment out of that. All right, well, thank you. I, I would just close with the fact that, you know, we have a president that's made it his policy since he took office not to knee-jerk or jump to conclusions when it comes to some tragedy or event. But yet, why did he do it in this case? Why was he quick to jump to the conclusion that this was a protest due to a YouTube video? I think we all know that's not true, and I think we all need to find the answer to that. Th thank you. And, and could, could I, Of course. Could I just clarify? The, the job that I have right now, between my curtailment and my finding of this job that I have now, I had no meaningful employment. Um, I was in a status called Near Eastern Affairs over complement, and uh, the job now is a significant, it, it's a demotion. Foreign Affairs Officer is a, is a designation that is given to our civil service colleagues who function, who are desk officers, so, it's effect, so I've been effectively demoted from Deputy Chief of Mission to Desk Officer. Let me just uh, interject one thing at this time. Uh, in your opening statement, I note, and it's already in the record, but uh, I want to make sure that it's separately placed in at this moment, uh, you, uh, you included an unclassified document uh, purported to be from the President of the United States to the President of Libya. Is that correct? Yes. I want to be very careful. Uh, it doesn't have a signature. It's, uh, it looks like it was electronically transmitted. It's a cable. This cable, was it, as far as you know, from the President of the United States directly? Yes. And was it delivered to the President of Libya directly? It was. And does it mention terrorist attack anywhere else? And I'd note that this is September 17th, which would be that Monday afterwards. Do, uh, does this, in your opinion, in any way, shape, or form, describe the unfortunate circumstances as terrorism to the president of Libya. I, I believe it does. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. I, 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 I don't even it's know. In, it's, in, it's, it's in his opening statement. It was delivered to everybody. Okay. Uh, these are inclusions. Uh, but uh, it says, thank you for responding quickly to the tragic attack Benghazi. And I'm reading through this thing, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, well, I, it's in the record, but I, as far as I can tell, uh, it speaks of it as a tragic attack. It doesn't speak to it even after Secretary or Ambassador Rice spoke. It doesn't speak to it as a terrorist attack or our war on terror or fighting terrorism. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't have it before me at this point at this moment. Okay, we'll deliver it back to you just to make sure someone may want to follow up in a moment. Your counsel has it for you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it says outrageous attack. Okay, so it's an outrageous attack, but it doesn't talk about us working together to fight terrorism, does it? No. Okay, thank you for including that in the record. We now go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farrell. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to uh, also uh, join my colleagues on both sides of the aisle in expressing our condolences to the families of Ambassador Stevens, uh, Sean Smith, Tyrone Wood, and Glenn Doherty, and all of those others injured. I want to quickly uh, clear up just a couple of loose ends from earlier uh, earlier testimony, and then I want to ask a couple of questions about the February uh, 17th Martyr Brigade. But first off, Mr. Hicks, you, you've testified on numerous uh, occasions that you never got a chance to read the classified ARB report. You do have uh, security clearance that uh, you sat in with the meeting with Mr. Chaffetz that your minder couldn't uh, attend. So you do have security clearance. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. And then, Mr. Thompson, uh, you testified in answer to the uh, question as to why um, the FEST team, uh, the, your response team was not uh, deployed. Uh, the, uh, one of the things you heard was it might not be to a safe location. Do you guys train to deploy to Canada or the Caribbean islands or other safe locations, or are you uh, trained to respond to hot spots? Hot spots. Uh, and uh, you don't, would there have been any reluctance on the part of you or any uh, of the men or women in uh, your organization to uh, go to Libya or anywhere in the world that you were needed to protect Americans? Um, I um, I hang out with a very noble and brave crowd. The answer is no. I didn't think so. And then, uh, Mr. Hicks, I want to talk uh, a little bit about what was going on in um, in Libya at the time. There had just been a revolution. We had a newly elected uh, president, democratically 
uh, elected. Uh, we were involved uh, through, our, through our NATO partners uh, in, in that. This was a, probably a win for the United States. We had a friendly government, a relatively friendly government, uh, going in, and then uh, we all but make the uh, new president out. To, we, we throw him under the bus on the Sunday shows. Uh, and you testify that that may have been one of the reasons the FBI was slow getting in. Did it, do you think it uh, overall damaged our relationship beyond that with Libya? It complicated things for that period of time, I think, particularly with respect to the FBI mission. But the Libyan people, as a poll released by Gallup right before 9-11 attests, uh, valued our relationship highly. In fact, higher than almost any other Arab country. It was over 50% of the population. And isn't that one of the reasons Ambassador Stevens went to uh, Benghazi uh, on that fateful day is to continue to show uh, our support for what was going on in Libya at the time? Absolutely, especially to the people of Benghazi. All right, now I want to go on. Uh, I, there have been some reports floating around. Can you, uh, Mr. Nordstrom, can you tell me uh, what the role of the February 17th Martyrs Brigade was in protecting the consulate uh, in Benghazi? Uh, certainly. That was the, the unit, for lack of a better term, uh, that was provided to us by the Libyan government. Now, were you, were you aware of any ties uh, of that militia to Islamic extremists? Uh, absolutely, yeah. We, we had that uh, discussion... Uh, on a number of occasions, um, the last of which was when there was a Facebook uh, posting uh, of a threat um, that named Ambassador Stevens and, and Senator McCain, who was coming out for the elections. That was in the jo July time frame. Uh, I had met with uh, some of my agents and then also with some annex personnel. Um, we discussed, uh, discussed that. And Mr. Hicks, uh, you were in Libya on the night of the attack. Do you believe the... Uh February 17th uh, militia uh, played a role in those attacks, was complacent in those attacks? Certainly elements of that militia were complicit in the attacks. The attackers had to make a long approach march through multiple checkpoints that were manned by February, February 17th militia. Uh, all right, now, uh, okay, I'm going to, Mr. Hicks, Mr. Nortzer, I'm going to ask you both this question. I mean, I'm stunned that the State Department was relying on a militia with extremist ties to protect uh, American diplomats. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. How does that happen? You mean like in Afghanistan where Afghanis that are uh, working with our military that are embedded and turn on them uh, and shoot them? Or uh, Yemen, our, our embassy was attacked in 2008 by attackers wearing police uh, uniforms or in uh, Saudi Arabia in Jeddah we had an attack in 2004 the Saudi National Guard that was protecting our facility uh, reportedly ran from the scene and then it took 90 minutes before we could get help um, pretty high unemployment in the <laughs> United States I'd imagine there's some people that would be willing to take it Americans that would be willing to take I, I, jobs overseas we, we couldn't agree with you more uh, but unfortunately as I said earlier one of the things that, that we ran into that was the best bad plan that was the unit that uh, the Libyan government had initially designated for VIP protection. Um, well, I, I it was very hope difficult to extract ourselves from that. I certainly hope that these hearings will result in us not having to rely on the best of bad plans, and we can use folks like Mr. Thompson and his group for what they were uh, intended and, uh, and secure our personnel. I see I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. Only by a little. We now go to the distinguished gentleman from the great state of Washington, the chairman of the Resources Committee, Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and let me add my uh, voice to all of my colleagues that uh, thank you for your service. I think while we all say it, it should, probably should go without saying it, but nevertheless, uh, we, we really do appreciate that. Mr. Uh, Hicks, I want to follow up. Uh, you may have answered this, and so I just want to get a clarification because Mr. Jordan was entering into questions regarding the lawyer that came in and was not allowed to go to the meeting because of wasn't uh, uh, qualified to go to that meeting. My, my question specifically is to back up. The State Department sent this lawyer. Were you told why the lawyer was sent? He was sent to participate in all the meetings and all events associated with Congressman Chaffetz's visit. Okay. D did you find that unusual? Uh, I never had occurred before in my career okay but but they did the state department did say that this lawyer was going to come and participate in all of the meetings 
Yes, you were told that. And then, of course, they couldn't because of the protocol. Uh, you mentioned that the um, tone of the State Department has related to you changed after, probably after the Rice interview. It began to change. Yeah. Uh, uh, explain, just give us some examples of how things changed. Uh, again, I began to uh, have my management style counseled by Assistant Secretary Jones. Uh, when she visited, she again uh, counseled me on my management style and said staff was upset. I had had no s indication of staff being upset. Uh, and then again, when I returned to Washington, she delivered a very uh, blistering critique of my style and again said, exclaimed, I don't know why Larry Pope would want you back. Uh, well, let me, that, that leads to a very obvious question then. Prior to September 10th, 2012, had you received any negative feedback from your superiors? Uh, no, uh, Chris and I had, devel had developed a very positive relationship. We, uh, he trusted me, I trusted him, and we were working together very, very well. And the people, morale was high. Well, I suppose in a, in a career as long as yours, you might have some disagreement with your superiors. Was it to the extent that you have uh, felt that you were treated after, uh, after this event last September compared to prior maybe dis disagreements you may have with your uh, superiors? Uh, I, I guess never, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst, 10. and uh, you, you were 10 a after. Okay. All right. I, that, that's, uh, I guess that's what I would, would like to uh, uh, wanted to follow up on. Um, you mentioned that you feel in the job you have you uh, is really a demotion from the qualifications that you have had in your career in the, in the service. Have you um, talked to any of your colleagues or any senior leaders within the State Department regarding this? And if so, what uh, what was that, those conversations all about? I uh, <clears throat> I spoke with uh, well after a couple of friends who are outside the department intervened with senior officials about my situation. Um, the, uh, the Deputy Secretary Burns and the Director General said that my, I would be taken care of. Uh, same thing that Larry Pope had indicated. And so I met with uh, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary um, for Human Resources, Hans Clem, and I talked to him about what options might be available to me. Um, and basically the answer was I ha would have to go through the formal normal bidding process for assignments and persuade someone that I should be hired uh, and then uh, the conversation with Deputy Secretary Burns was centered around uh, discussions I'd had with the leadership of our embassy in Mexico City about the head of the political section job there which would be a very uh, good job uh, but and he said that he would support that, but I had to go through the process, and it's a very long process since the position, that position is at a higher grade. Well, let, let, me, let me ask you this. I, uh, in going through the process, and I understand there's protocols, but would that strike you as unusual as somebody with your background and the position that you had uh, uh, in Libya and, and other areas? I was surprised that that I was having to go through the process, the normal process. Okay. And especially when amba the ambassador in Mexico City had talked to Deputy Secretary Burns about bringing me on as his political counselor. Well, I heard my colleagues uh, on the other side of the aisle say that if there's any retribution, that's my words, not your words, any retribution on this, that you will have full support of your colleagues. Uh, let me lend uh, my support and I think support of everybody here. Uh, I think a bipartisan support on somebody that comes forth that has a difference of agreement on a very on a policy issue or a decision that kill four Americans deserve to uh, have uh, whatever uh, we can give to you. So thank you very much, and I see my time has expired. Well, and the time that we can ask witnesses to stay seated without a break has also expired. So for those of us who were able to get up and come back and forth, uh, we're going to take uh, about 10 minutes. I would ask the witnesses, you can either go through that door or this door to use uh, facilities that are available there without going out into the public, and then we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
House Oversight Committee is saying that the committee taking about a 10-minute break. They've been at it for just over four hours, a hearing on the attacks on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, Libya, on September 11, 2012. We're going to stay here live and open up our phone lines to hear from you about what you've seen over the past four hours or so. The numbers to use to call in are for Democrats, 202 585 3885 for Republicans, 202 585 3886 for independents and others. That's 202 585 3887. We will also check our Facebook page. We posted a comment, posted a question earlier today about your thoughts on the Benghazi investigation, and in particular what you're hearing today from the three witnesses uh, Gregory Hicks, Eric Nordstrom, and, and Mark Thompson. So that's Facebook.com slash C SPAN. For those of you on Twitter, our hashtag today is Benghazi. Lots of tweets. We'll get to a couple of them as we will get to your phone calls as well. Again, it should be about uh, 10, 15 minutes for this, uh, this break in the House Oversight Committee. Just a couple other notes, too. Of the five or more hours we expect of hearings today, we're going to play back the highlights, some of the highlights this evening on C-SPAN beginning at about 9 o'clock Eastern. And we'll also have that for you at uh, Sunday, Sunday, 10.30 a.m. Eastern, highlights from today's hearing. Again, it's gone four hours already. The word from the committee is it could go several hours more. So lots to see, lots to talk about. Rich is in White Plains, New York, on our Republican line. Hi, Rich. Hey, how you doing? Doing fine, thanks. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that there's a cover-up by the testimony uh, given today in Congress. Um, people who were there are saying that there was absolutely no protest, there, that this was a an attack, there was no demonstration, and um, the administration uh, has to explain themselves as to how they came about with the false narrative put forward by Susan Rice. Well, Alfred Maine is next up, Republican line. There's Dylan. Hi, Dylan. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, I've got a comment from the Democrats. Um, they need to clean it up and get their act together here. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking for some real clean answers that shouldn't be that difficult. Um, the truth is, uh, the, the truth is, it has been pulled once. It needs to be black and white with the Democrats folks on, you know, um, on the side, and, you know, there needs to be no room for error here. Uh, we're a strong country, thank God it was a horrible attack, and we're ready to move forward, period. Next up, we go to the independent line. Joe in Orlando, Florida. Joe, you've been watching. What have you seen or heard so far in the hearing? I've watched it all. I'm surprised I didn't take a lunch break, but I've watched <laughs> Um, I, I find it scandalous that not one Democrat has asked one question about anything that happened. Uh, it doesn't seem like they're interested at all. Um, you know, being an independent, I, I watched Ambassador Rice. It doesn't pass the smell test. Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and Rice all talked about this video, and they knew it wasn't true. There's no way anyone can think that they knew that thought that story was true. And it's scandalous that uh, nobody on, on the Democratic side seems to be interested in that. Of course, hearings were held in the 112th Congress Oversight Committee of the House. This is their first hearing on the issue in the 113th Congress. Again, hearing from three witness, witnesses today, three State Department witnesses. They're in a break here. We continue with your phone call. Sterling, Virginia, Paul's next, Republican line. Hello. Go ahead. Hi, Paul. Hi, yeah, I just kind of wanted to comment on the Democrats' very lockstep um, sort of agenda here, trying to blame everything on the funding, even though all the witnesses have very coherently and very explicitly stated that the major issue has been the decisions made by people higher up in the organization, the secretary or assistant secretary of state. Um, and. And I, I just don't see any room for blaming it on the funding uh, the, that was decided by uh, the House of Representatives earlier in the year. Let's see what folks on Twitter are saying as we wait for the committee to gavel back in. Again, the hashtag we're using is Benghazi. Here's one from TV Capitalism who writes, If the media was wondering why the majority of Americans have lost faith in them, they should look at their own Benghazi coverage. Another one here from Richard, Jersey City. Daryl Issa, instead of spending my tax dollars on Benghazi, what about no weapons of mass destruction? 
And here's one from uh, uh, Liliana who retweets. She says also Watergate, Watergate, this tweet that says, I remember as a kid, Iran-Contra on every channel today, Benghazi, Benghazi cover-up, not a peep on ABC, NBC, or CBS. Joel's in Woodland Hills, California. He's on our Democrats' line. Joel, go ahead. Yes, I, I just find this, you know, as a Democrat, I find this to be just ridiculous and embarrassing for me as a Democrat to hear these Democrats, you know, look at the truth and not, 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 not back the truth. And I just think that this whole group, from Obama to Hillary Clinton, should be held responsible for what they did. And it's quite obvious what they did. Not only the cover-up, but they didn't protect those people. On the center of your screen, there is uh, Representative Michelle Bachman of Minnesota. She's not a member of the committee. She has been sitting in the hearing uh, since the start. Also, you may have been watching earlier, you may have seen um, former Congressman Pete Hookstra from uh, from Michigan, who was once the, the ranking Republican on the Select Intelligence Committee. He sat through a good bit of the hearing today. They're in a break. Back in a few minutes. Live coverage continuing here on C-SPAN, on C-SPAN Radio. And we welcome our C-SPAN Radio listeners to the uh, conversation, which, by the way, if you're uh, traveling around, it's on XM Satellite Radio, Channel 119. East Lake, Ohio. Jackie, welcome to our conversation. Go ahead. Hi. Um I love the way it's uh, scripted by the Republicans. Uh, uh, they apparently uh, got together with the uh, with the three people ahead of time, and and they uh, they were they were very well very well versed uh, on on the on the subject. Uh, the questions were were so nicely answered and so well scripted. Uh, I I must I must give the Republicans their due. They they did a job. Uh, they're doing their best to bring down a president and uh, to make sure that that Mrs. Clinton uh, has something uh, bad on her on her record for 2016. Thank so, you. Some of the testimony of uh, Gregory Hicks was released early by the uh, committee earlier this week and made maybe some of what you're referring to as well in Springdale. Arkansas is Patty. She's on our uh, Republican line. Go ahead, Patty. Yeah, hi. Hi there. Yeah, yeah, this is really interesting. I'm a disabled veteran. I'm the longest running continuous dis disability claim in the United States of America, 20 years. I'm into my 20th year. But anyway, put that aside. Uh, yeah, uh, I cannot believe this. You know, these gentlemen are telling the truth, and, and then the Democrats, I don't think they have it on a straight question. You know, they keep going to, you know, the budget, the money and everything. Well, you know, that's partially probably true, but that, that doesn't account for what happened to him on September 11th. No one's bringing up the fact September 11th, you know, 9-11. You know, it, it just amazes me. But I tell you what, if I was a Democrat, I wouldn't be anymore. <laughs> Patty, thanks for the call. Here's what some of the, uh, lots of comments on Facebook, some of them here. This is from Kilo Sierra, who writes, There never was an attempt to get mil military overflights permission that day in Libya, that's a question. Meanwhile, some in the, the some of the Dems in this hearing are spending their time injecting media matters, talking points, and diversions. Tracy says, I am watching. What proof? Where? John Barry says, we are the most powerful nation on earth, plus we had just helped militarily in taking down the previous government, even had a couple of our planes shoot down. We didn't get permission just to do it. Besides, what are the Libyans going to do? Come over and invade us? And finally, Elizabeth Jane Shackelford saying they're just blowing wind in the wind. It's a witch hunt. Tom's in Westminster, Maryland, calling on the Independence Line. Tom, go ahead. Hi. Uh, comment is very quick. I just wanted to say I think it's uh, very much a shame that we'll probably never get to the bottom of this due to the fact that it's so transparently clear that the parties are sticking to party loyalty. Well, take the, te and take the testimony today. Does this, the testimony today, get us any closer to that clarity you're talking about? Well, I think uh, the Republicans are doing a better job at ferreting out facts. Uh, it seems the Democrats are doing a better job at uh, party protection. Tom, thanks for the call. Here in Washington, Mike's on our uh, Mike's on our Democrats line. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, two real quick comments. There's there's some at some point they made Susan Rice's 
talk show appearance the official statement. Never was. Obama said the day after this was an act of terror. So right there we're looking at a situation where they're trying to basically frame a specific narrative specifically with, you know, exactly when, at what point did they call this an act of terror? Was it a terrorist incident? Was it the protest, etc.? Second thing, the Republicans are doing their best to try and nail the State Department and or the national security team, but not point fingers at the generals who made the security decisions in the first place. This testimony is pretty much pointing out that at some point there were military individuals who made military decisions about the kind of protection that he should have had, that Ambassador Stevens should have had, and no one's willing to really kind of go any further and say, well, wait a minute, should we be looking at exactly whether or not we should be pointing fingers at military officials? No, no, let's keep it up with the state officials and with the Obama administration officials. Mike, thanks for your call. Some of the video you're watching just there, the uh, video from earlier the, of Chairman Issa, and just to let you know, they're gathering back in the room. We'll be going back there live shortly here on C-SPAN. And a quick reminder about our programming coming up this evening. And on Sunday, if you missed any of today, we will have the highlights for you tonight, 9 o'clock Eastern. That'll be here on C-SPAN. Same on Sunday, except it'll be 10.30.